Dr. Fosh, y'all settled in? All set to go? So far, so good. Okay, well, listen, guys, thanks for hanging out with me and uh, the great Dr. Alan Fox today. And um, uh, yeah, today we're going to dig into uh, a fun story about, um, I think, specifically one of Alan's uh, tournaments, 1966, the Pacific Southwest Championships. And as you can see down below with the in the blue type with wins over the four, over the four current slam title holders, Santana, Stolly Roach and Emerson. Um, Alan, first of all, thanks so much for carving out some time for us today. We, we really appreciate it. Well, thanks for the invitation, Brent. I appreciate it. So you and I were chatting before we, before we started the recording and, and really what I want to do is I, I know that when we, when we sort of organized this, you were talking about one thing you want to talk about was, how I beat your idol, Roy, Roy Emerson, which in this tournament, the Pacific Southwest that year was in the finals. But I want to go back. I want to go back before the tournament started. And, 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 and the U.S. Nationals was always played right before the Pacific Southwest in Los Angeles. And then after that, they'd come up to uh, Berkeley and, and play the Pacific Coast. Um, I thought for some reason that – you would play the U.S. Nationals that year, but you corrected me and said that you hadn't. So why don't we start with the story there in terms of you'd already played, I guess you'd already won the Canadian that summer, play, maybe played a few other tournaments. Um, yeah, but kind of, kind of give us the backstory to, uh, to well, that the backstory on that. Uh, I, I rarely missed the U.S. grass tour and, and the U.S. championship at Forest Hills, but the, the previous year, I'd taken a whole year off, and Donald Dell and I had played six months in Africa, and then we went to Europe and played Wimbledon, and so I had been away from my studies for a year. The, my professors were kind enough to let me off. So this next year, I was gonna have to, you know, book it and, and, and do my work. So I didn't play the U.S. for at all. Uh, I stayed in my lab, uh, and I snuck out for a couple weeks, went up to Canada, uh, played the Canadian Nationals and two other tournaments, uh, and I won the Canadian Nationals somehow. Actually, that was one of my tougher wins. In the semis, I played the, this guy, Bob Bedard, who's quite good in Canada, and I was down two sets to love, like 12-10, 11 9 2 it was all grass and so it was about two and a half three hours and i was already down two sets and so i managed to come back and win that and the final i was so confident after winning the semi that i sort of rolled through the final and that was that was really the momentum i had going into the pacific southwest hmm. uh, the pacific southwest by the way, back in the day, was probably the second biggest tournament in the United States because they would get all the Australians on their way home. Uh, and the Aussies were the best in the world with uh, Nukem and Roach and uh, Stolle and, and, and Emmo. Uh, and then they'd invite a couple of Europeans and they'd usually have a half a dozen of the top 10 at, at the tournament. So it was a tough tournament. Uh, and I, I didn't have any particular hopes of, of doing anything. A week before, uh, you know, after, after uh, Canada, uh, but the week before the tournament, I went back east for my brother's wedding and ate a lot of birthday cake and didn't play a lot of tennis. And so I, I came into the tournament a little fat, a bit overweight, uh, and, and I just, I, I didn't have any great hopes. Uh, and so in an early round, I should have lost, actually, uh, to a, an English gentleman named Graham Stillwell, who was a tough, tough player. Mm -hmm. and, and we split the first two sets. And then I was down 4-1, I think, in the third, and luckily came back. Uh, and by the way, in those days, we played with a lighter ball. It wasn't this heavy-duty ball they use now. It was a lighter one. And the concrete in the Southwest was slick. It was fast stuff. And so it paid to serve in volley if you could do it 
reasonably well. Uh, I was a serve volleyer like almost everybody else. Uh, but I was a defensive-minded serve volleyer. You know, I serve volleyed because I didn't want to hit passing shots against these other guys. They were great volleyers. And, and being back on the baseline on that slick concrete with a light ball, it was a piece of work to pass. So uh, anyway, once I got past Stillwell, then the next guy in the round of 16 was Santana, who had won Wimbledon. I mean, he was a great player. And it was the first time I ever played him. And, and Santana was a maestro with top spins on both sides. And, and he was very tricky and, and very dangerous. And I saw him the year before in 1965 when I was in Europe. I saw him play Emmo in the finals of Bostad. And, and he took Emmo apart on the clay. I mean, he made mincemeat out of him. And, and of course, I lost in the semis to Emmo in that one. And, and I was thinking to myself, as I saw Santana it, it sort of disassemble Emmo, I was thinking, God, I'm glad I'm not playing this guy. <laughs> Oof. I, he, he would have carved me into, you know, little bite-sized pieces on the clay. Because just for whatever purposes, the, ser the trouble with the clay, serving and volleying, you could do it on the clay, which I did. But I didn't have a big serve in volley because I'm not a big guy. And so the clay sort of slowed it down. And, and unless you really could hit big on the clay, you know, and blow through the guy, if you let him hit passing shots and you tried to scramble at the net, you know, against someone like Santana, that would be, that would be death. Okay. But luckily I was playing him now in, in the Southwest on slick concrete with a light ball. <laughs> And so that's a different story. And so the top spins and drop shots, they were tough. But, uh, and so we had a very, very tough first set. I think 10-8 or 11-9 or 12-10, something. Long first set. And then we were playing in Los Angeles. And LA at that time uh, didn't have some of the environmental controls that it has now. So the air was bad. Mm. And, and, and I was used to that sort of stuff. Maybe my, I had leather lungs from playing in Los Angeles over the years. But, but Santana, I could see him start to cough <laughs> in the second set. And so the second set, he was pretty much done for. Uh, so I, I, I can't, I can take credit for the first set. The second set, I have to give credit to uh, some of the uh, substantial buses in Los Angeles. The LA smog takes yeah. its toll. Yeah, 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 yeah. Puffing out this stuff. The next match was against Roach. Tony had won, uh, he had won the French. But again, that was clay. Uh, he, he, you know, and all, everybody could play grass and fast courts too, but uh, I, concrete's a special thing, really. It, it, it was a, a special surface that I played on all the time, and my game was adapted to it. And, and, and the way I played was, I'd get in a lot of first serves. I had a pretty good flat first serve. It moved off the court. It was somewhat, it wasn't big aces, but it was enough to push them back. And then I'd get into the net, and I was a, a very good at low volleys and, and, and controlling the volley. But I didn't have like big come, uh, put away shots right away. My, my move was to serve, get in, hit the first low volley deep. Uh, my, in my mind, it needed to be within a yard of the baseline. A foot was better, a yard marginal. If I could get it within a foot of the baseline, the guy was not going to pass me. Hmm. You know, I could move. The, the footing was great. And so I could cover the next ball. The second ball was my put away. Uh, and so, and by the way, if I hit it within a yard, less than a yard from the baseline, then I was subject to getting passed. They could pass, but not off the deep skidding ones. So that, that was it. That didn't work on the clay. If you, if you did that and you volleyed this sort of deep volley, it's sat up, stopped, 
the ball was big and they could pass it. So you had to do more than I did. But concrete was made for me. Or I developed my game on it, so maybe I was made for it. And so against Tony, uh, that was the first time I played him. I actually liked playing lefties. I was, I was very good against lefties. Hmm. Why? Because my backhand was far and away better side. Okay. And, and I was one of the few in my era that used topspin on the backhand. You know, I, I could slice, but I liked the topspin. And, and I had topspin off the forehand as well. Uh, so I, I could pass. Uh, and against Tony, his serve was not really that big. And so it went into my backhand. And we, we, we played a very a tough first set. Uh, and then I think I got one ad on his serve to break him at the end of the first set. And, he, and I hit a running backhand. It was just felt great, you know, right into the corner, passing shot. It broke, and then in the second set, I sort of we had a weird incident. Am I boring you on no, this? No, I love all this. This is fascinating. Okay, well, here's the incident I had with Roach, and this sort of tells a little bit of maybe about both of us. Okay, uh, at this stage in the second, I get up two breaks. I'm up four one in the second, uh, and so I pretty much got him. But in the back of my mind. Uh, uh, Stolly is in the semis, and and the year before I played Stolly at uh, at the Southwest, and I beat him like six three six one. I beat him badly. Uh, I had a good game for playing against Fred, and so now I realize if I can get past Roach, I'm going to play Stolly in the semis, which is perfect for me, and it's all televised. The semis and the final are televised, and I wanted to be on TV. Uh, not like today where everyone's on TV all right. the time. Uh, that didn't happen that much. So I had to beat Roach. <laughs> and so this is how, how over the top I was. It's my serve, 4-1. I win the first point. I'm up 50 in love. I want that next one. And so I serve, and he hits a very, very good low return to my backhand volley, which I sort of hit it inside out backhand volley uh, that goes deep, you know, down the line, sort of onto the, just right on the sideline and away from him. And he barely gets to it and he tries, he slaps it and it's, he goes right down that same line, down that line for a down the line passing shot and misses it by about two yards. And the linesman goes like this, good. At the time, they had one linesman that was calling the entire line, okay? And so he's calling Tony's, uh, he's calling, uh, no, excuse me, he says, out. I'm sorry, I screwed up my own story. He says, out, because he's calling Tony's ball. Right. Mine hits the line, but he, 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 he didn't call it. And so the, the umpire says, 15 all. Oh. Oh. I go, wait a second. You know, Tony's ball was out, you know, two yards. Yeah. You know, mine was on the line. And so I said, you know, which ball are you calling? And I've screwed this story up twice, actually. This but, is the best part of it right he here. Calling, he was calling Tony's ball because that, anyway, we go round and round on it. And, and Tony comes up to the net. And he says to me, Alan, don't worry about it. You know, I'll throw the next point. Wow. Wow. Yeah, because the umpire said, I can't overrule the linesman. Right. Uh, and so. So what did he do? What did, what did Tony Roach do to throw the next point? Just not return the serve? Or? Served it in and he hit it, you know, yeah. into the side fence. Right. You know, <laughs> okay. my point. He, he was a very, but that was the way he was. That's it, right. it, it, and I guess the point I'm getting at is I was over the top. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted that point <laughs> because it was mine. <laughs> right. Sure. Hit the outside of the line on a tough shot, you know. And so I wanted 30 love. I didn't want 15 all. I could lose that game, you know. And, and the next thing you know, we're back even. I, I, I wanted that game and I wanted 5-1, period. End of story. 
And so, so does he and end up does he end up breaking serve in that game? No, I no. held you held. for five one, and then I broke him again. Oh wow! At, at five one, and so it was six one. So that was a Tony Roach story, and now we get to Santana in the semi. I, I mean, uh, Stolly in the semi. Right. Uh, Stolly. Uh, now against Stolly, I, I played pretty darn well against Roach. Great. Well, against Stolly was kind of a grind. I really wasn't playing well. That's because I thought I could beat him. Uh, and, and, I, and I wanted to beat him. And I didn't think I had to do too much. I didn't think I had to play extraordinary tennis to do it. So when you go into a match like that, you're not taking your normal risks. You know, you're, you're playing conservatively because you think you, you're going to win. You know, and you don't have to do too much. But this so, guy, this guy had just won the U.S. Nationals. The week that's before. right. We, yeah, he'd won the U.S. Championship the week right. before. And so you're thinking, yeah, you know, I got this guy. That's right. That's how I felt. Okay. Because I, I played him the year before, and right. I beat him badly. Right. You know, yeah. like I killed him. Uh, actually, he had the kind of game. You know, there's certain games that, like, I hated to play Stan Smith. Ugh, he was horrible for me. But, but Stolly, I like to play because, you know, like Stolly, uh, he served deep. He, he was a big guy, about 6'3", with a big serve. Uh, but he didn't serve well wide. He served deep, mm. hard, both first and second serve. And that was fine. I just backed up about eight feet. And so I had time. He couldn't, I, you know, you back up unless the guy can serve you wide. Then it's, then it's really tough. But he didn't. You know, he served hard and deep. So returning wasn't a problem. And, and, and secondly, he, he had a very good serve return, but he wasn't, didn't hit passing shots on the run very well. You know, he was sort of big and not very fast, but he hit hard returns. And, but everybody returned my serve at my feet. It didn't bother me at all. He'd hit a hard low return, and I could, like, hit a low volley into the corner and run him, and they'd have to hit a passing shot, which he didn't do very well. And so I could hold serve against him. But, but it became a tough match because I was cautious. And, you know, I wanted to beat him too much. And so I was cautious. I think I was down a break. I think he served for the set, maybe, at 5-4, and I broke him back. But it was a squeaky, kind of an ugly match. You know, not, not, not pretty, but I ground my way through. Then, so, so now you get to Emmo, and Emmo's your idol. Um, he's my idol. He's a great player. He's the best player. I'd watched Emmo winning Wimbledon and every tournament beating everybody, killing really good players. How uh, much older, how much older is Emmo? Emmo is maybe three or four years older than me. Okay. I, think I, was so. about, I was about 26 or seven at this time. Emmo must have been 29, pushing 30. So was it his style of play? Was it his, his, his mental? What was it about Emmo that, 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 that for you, this guy's my idol? Well, a number of reasons. Number one, Emil could do anything. He was a very athletic guy. He was fast. He didn't slice the backhand. He hit flat, basically. He, he hit flat serve returns. He had two pretty good sides. I, I think the forehand might have been a little weaker, but I didn't like playing people's forehands because uh, you can't tell where they're going. Uh, the backhand might even be better, but you could sort of guess where it was going easier. So he was athletic and he could hit passing shots on the run from anywhere. Mm. He had a pretty good serve, not a great serve, but he was a good, very good volleyer. You know, he got in on you. He was very fit and, and, and he was a champion. So when, when you got down to the crunch, you're playing the champion who's probably not going to choke on the big point. He's probably going to hit a good shot. And it'll be, and Emil was the kind of guy he fought to the finish. You, you didn't get anything cheap from him. So I, I didn't relish the thought of trying to serve for the set or serve for the match against a guy like him who could hit every shot. And so, and plus he'd beaten me fairly soundly 
at, at Bostad the year before on clay. Right. right. And so, you know, I, I just thought he was a great player. I, and, and on top of it, he was a great person. You know, he, he was such a nice guy. Uh, example, my first trip to Europe, uh, I played Barcelona, 1963. And I had a bad loss on clay, which was not unusual for me. Lost early. And I'm sitting, uh, I didn't know Emerson at the time. I, I'd seen him play, but I didn't know him personally, really, other than, hello, Emmo, hello, Alan, you know, that, but no. And, and so I'm sitting moping in the, in the locker room. And Emmo comes up, he sort of slaps me on the back and says, hey, Foxy, let, you know, uh, how about I take you to Rambless tonight and we go have a few beers and forget about it, which we did. But I thought to myself after that, you know, M.O. is the best player in the world. You know, I'm not in his league, really. And he's nice enough just because I'm, you know, took a bad loss and not feeling happy. You know, he wants to cheer me up. That's cool. It, well, he's a great person. Yeah, yeah. Well, on top of being a great player. I'm curious, too, that with, with, with Laver, M.O., Laver being physically more your size, right? Sort of five, five, eight, five, eight, Emerson. five, nine. He might have been an inch taller than me. Okay. So physically, you guys are the same. Obviously, a righty and a lefty. Um, but Emo's a bigger guy. Emo's about six feet. Yeah. Yeah. So bigger guy. And but but Laver never held that kind of kind of uh, idol status for you. As, as, it, as it did for... Uh, well, not yet. He hadn't yet. I played Labor a time or two, actually. And, and, and I felt I could do better against Labor, actually. Hmm. Uh, he had, his serve was not uh, really that dangerous, so I, I could play against his serve. And he did tend to chip his backhand return. He could hit over it, but he chipped it. Hmm. Uh, the, what I didn't realize, I mean, I had some, the first time I played him, you know, it was like 7-5 in the third set at Orange, New Jersey, yeah. on the grass. I didn't think he was that good. Yeah. I didn't realize that everybody goes three sets. It doesn't matter. You don't beat them. You know, it, it, getting a set is one thing. Beating him is another thing. I didn't realize at the time that I probably I wasn't going to beat him. He, mm. he, you know, he would come up with some some extraordinary stuff, you know, uh, in the big points, which is murderous. So let's let's go to the finals. You're now in the finals. It's on TV. You know, this is this is is this like the match of your life right now? Is this like the big stage yeah. for you? And yeah, I've grown like, up with the Southwest. Yeah, you know, going there and watching Rosewall play somebody and this guy, you know, all the great players had won it. You know, it was a great player tournament all the way back through Tilden and all these others. And so it, it was a very special to me. I, I, when I walked out in the court with Emmo, I didn't think I would have bet everything I owned that I was going to lose hmm. and no particular hope. I was just happy to be in the finals and on television, to be honest, right. you know, Right. Uh, and, and, and so uh, we spin, Emmo uh, wins the toss, and he elects to receive. Because Emmo is figuring, you know, I'm going to be nervous. I lost last time. This is a big situation. You know, he might get up a break right away. And so I go to serve that game. And weirdly enough, I'm serving and volleying quite well. I felt, <laughs> you know, I... I I didn't have any hopes of winning, but I felt quite good. Mm -hmm. And I won my serve at love pretty much. And then I was right on MO serve. Every time he served, I was returning the first serve and the second serve, all of them, and, and no real problem. And so right away, I was on, you know, in the games that he was serving, which I couldn't quite understand why that was. But, uh, and, and as the sets progressed, I was thinking to myself, you know, I'd watched Emo play many times. I thought he had a pretty big serve, you know. I'd seen him beat Chuck McKinley, and McKinley was too short. Serve wasn't as good as Emo's. 
But somehow that day, MO serve just seemed, I was seeing the ball so well. I guess I had won those three matches coming up to the final. And so, you know, confidence is pretty much a function of winning on, in, a sh in the short run. You know, you win a bunch of matches and you start feeling like you, you, you're good or you, you get, there's something down low in your brain that, that feels good. You know, like you think you're going to win, even though consciously I didn't think I was going to win. I just felt good. And so, and, and I was ahead of the ball. And so I think maybe I won the first set 6-3 pretty comfortably. And then the second set, I get up a break right away pretty much. And, and, and we're going along. And Emma was serving five down 3-5 in the second set. And here, some, two things happened that were sort of somewhat magical, I thought. Weird. Now, now when I'm up a set in 5-3, I'm beginning to think maybe I could win. <laughs> and, and so on, on, it's on the deuce point, he serves me wide. He served a wide one to my forehand. And I, I reached uh, way out and sort of hit a floating return. I could barely get to the serve. And so I hit it back, but it was sort of floating up to his backhand volley, which was, was his best volley. He had a very good high backhand volley. I was off the court, and I sprinted back onto the court. I mean, uh, it should have been a put away, but I think I had like, I don't know what, uh, wings on my feet for a moment. And so I managed to run the thing down all the way to the backhand corner. And I got to it and I threw up a very high lob. And Ev Ev Emma was on the sunny side. So the sun was in his eyes and it was a high lob. It, it, and he missed it. Wow. He didn't miss many overheads. No. He missed it. Wow. Now, match point for me. <laughs> oh, my God, I could win this thing, you know. <laughs> And he misses his first serve, and 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 now I got a second serve. My really my one of my very good strengths was I was very good returning second serves, because I, I was very mechanically sound. Okay, I wasn't a great athlete, so big first serves troubled me, generally. Although this day they weren't. But anyway, he missed his first serve, and so the second serve, I'm ready. And he slightly mishit it. I'm thinking double fault. Nope. Catches the line. Yeah, so nah, I flubbed the return. <laughs> I, I, I make that that common mistake. You know, it, it, don't ever for anyone watching, when, when when it's a big point and your opponent misses the first serve, the one thing you never want to do, uh, never think double fault terrible when you do that you're not ready to return and you're going to miss the return because he's not going to double fall okay so okay now it's back to deuce are we still on so it's back to deuce and he hits the same serve again wide way out there again and and i sort of hit the same return i just barely get it sort of floated back he's got a high backhand volley he drills it cross court and i run it down again and I throw up another high lob, okay? The chances of Emo missing two overheads at this point in the match is nil. I never saw him miss an overhead. He had a great overhead. But, I, you know, it, it was my day. Yeah. And he misses the overhead again. Wow. Misses two yeah. overheads in a row from, De from Deuce to give – now I got another match point. He misses his first serve. Now, this time, Emma almost double faulted last time. So right. now he's conservative. So he spins the second serve in, but it's short. He's not taking any chances. Okay. But it's perfect for my return. It was about a yard inside the service line. And I hit a very, very sharp cross court. The slice, but it was a hard slice. Just, Emma just barely reaches it. He's hitting a volley about an inch off the ground with his backhand volley right on the sideline there. Barely reached it. And he sort of, he gets it over. It lands on my service line, just sitting there. And so the ball is on the service line. And as I run over to get it, you know, I got a forehand. 
And I'm thinking, you shouldn't be thinking at these times, but I was. You know, I'm thinking to myself as I run over, I'm thinking, I will never get an easier shot than this to win the Southwest. Impossible. Sitting on the service line with an easy forehand. And so I'm, I, 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 and, and sadly, the other thought is, if I miss this shot and he holds serve, I'm going to have to serve it out at 5-4. Right. Which, right. when I'm doing all this thinking, it's not a good idea. You know, I'd better, and so I, I ran over the, and I hit it as hard as I, I put as much top spin as I possibly could on the ball. Uh, and I hit it as hard as I could, right back, on, and, and he, he couldn't handle it. Wow. wow. Missed the volley. Wow. And that was the end of that, and I'd never played that well again. <laughs> so, well, look. 1966, 54 years ago, and your recall, I mean, I can, I'm getting a little nervous as you're talking about this stuff. I mean, the, it, it's, you know, and this is totally off topic, but it's amazing to me how we can recall. 54 years ago, and, and you even went into the first time you had match points, a slight miss hit, all that kind of stuff. The memories yeah. are just so vivid. That um, that's awesome. So, well, so what happened? Something about memory, in case people, you, you know, when you're really emotionally involved, yeah. when it's really important to you, uh, and you've got emotion in it, the memory really sticks. Hmm. And 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 I had this this thought about memory, because after after I got done with the tennis tour, I went into the in, into the investment business actually. Uh, and, and I knew nothing about stocks and companies and so forth. And I, and I had to read the Wall Street Journal to familiarize myself with companies. And I would read it and it would go in one eye and out the other. There was no recall, hardly. It was very, very difficult. And, 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 and as I was doing that, I was thinking to myself, you know, I could go to the U.S. Championship at Forest Hills and see the, see the results of 64 matches, draw of 128, my eye could go down that 64 matches, and I could tell you pretty much who won the matches, who won each one, and about what the score was, you know, because I was interested, sure. very interested, and I knew the players, and it was all important to me as to who beat who and why. And so there's a huge difference in memory when you're – uh, emotionally involved and interested and when you're not so what happens you would you win the match does he say anything in the in the handshake up at net do you say anything is it anything anything happen up there no, I was in a state of shock I, I don't know you know actually winning the southwest was ridiculous in my mind just because it was a great tournament yeah. and, and beating all these players just wasn't going to happen uh, so no, not nothing was really said. We, you know, it was. Uh, and then was there any realization that you had just beaten every current Grand Slam holder during that year of 1966? Was there any thought of that? Maybe before the finals, going, hey, Alan, you know, you've beaten three. This could be the fourth guy right here. No, nope. no, I didn't even realize. I hadn't thought of it actually. I, I, I didn't really think of it. I didn't. I knew Santana had won Wimbledon, you know, and MO. I knew that, but I didn't think about it. I, I, I didn't, I didn't realize it actually. <laughs> it hadn't yeah. occurred to me. It, it's a very unusual circumstance to have the top four guys seed such that three are in one half and one in the other. That's not going to happen. Other than uh, Dennis Ralston was sort of a favorite of the tournament committee, mm. you know, so they seeded him ahead of, uh, I don't know, one one or two of the other guys uh, other than Emma. So uh, they had they had a, a, a stacked half. But awesome. that's not going to happen again. Right, you know, right. You know, um, not the computer, you don't get to do that. So I'm just curious, was there, I mean, is there one part of that tournament, is there one takeaway that ended up in your in your books? Is there one thing that you learned from that that, that is a foundational 
mental skill uh, from that term that it, that's ended up in your in your teaching and coaching? Uh, well, I suppose uh, there were a number of things that popped up, and I've probably mentioned them already, but just to out identify them. Number one, you, you don't have to think you're going to win in order to win. In other words, you could be quite willing to bet on the other guy if you had a bet. But of course, in tennis, you don't have to bet. All you have to do is go out and try to play your best. And, and in the end, you don't really know what's going to happen. So there's no need uh, to get yourself too psyched out uh, by somebody who you think is going to beat you. They may not. It's, it's, if it's your day, you'll beat them. Uh, and so the, there's no certainty in the game, no matter how, what, uh, what type of an underdog you are. Uh, that was number one. Number two, just that confidence uh, tends to follow winning. You know, it's not a magical thing. I don't think anybody could have talked me into the confidence I had when I played MO. I mean, I could have had a psychologist lined up from here to Berkeley, and, and I wouldn't have believed it. it, you, you, it confidence is a feeling. It's an expectation that you don't think about. You have it. And it comes, of course, from experience. I mean, it comes from two places. One, it comes from your just genetics. Some people are born more confident than others. And it comes from experience and performance. Uh, it doesn't come particularly from people telling you you're good if you aren't, okay? The whole self-esteem movement is sort of upside down. The self-esteem movement, yes, people that are that are confident tend to be more successful, but people that are more su successful tend to be confident, you know, and, and, and you, you, you can't instill, I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff where, where people are afraid to tell somebody that, that that's not a good performance because it'll hurt their confidence. But if it isn't a good performance, they know that. If you tell them it's a good performance, you don't build their confidence. They may say they're confident, but they aren't. You, you only get confident from reality, from performance. So there was an element of that in it that I've written, yeah. touched on in my books. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the coach's relationship. So here you are, you're working your way through this tournament. College coach there in attendance, college coach is coming up to you. I mean, you're – what are you now? Are you still in? No, I mean, you're not. I mean, you're, you're definitely. Well, definitely this days I'm in grad school. Yeah. Yeah. So I, UCLA coach in the, in, in kind of the mix during that week and trying to, trying to give you some words of encouragement. I mean, it's interesting what you just said about no one can make you confident. Was there anything, anyone in your corner that week to, um, to give you some words of wisdom? Well, no, I didn't get any words of wisdom. Well, I did get uh, guys told me how to, it was an, uh, and I hear something about getting advice in tennis. Okay. <laughs> I've been through advice many times. Uh, and advice is, is very dangerous to give people. Like they told me, uh, the, 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 some of the other players, they said, look, at, when you play MO, he's so fast uh, and he volleys so well, you have to hit the return hard. You have to, you, you can't let them volley, you know, you, you, uh, and I chipped my return. Okay. So if I had tried to listen to them and tried to hit my return hard, what would have happened is I would have changed my normal game, you know, because of their advice. And I would have missed a bunch of serve returns. I would be doing something I'm not good at. And, and, and that's always dangerous. And, and, and the first example I had of that is uh, in 1963, I was on the American Pan, Pan, Pan American Games team and played down in Brazil. I'd never left the country before. This is my first out of the country tournament. Uh, it was on clay, uh, not fast clay, but clay. And the advice I got was 
look at this is clay it's fairly slow you need to stay back and work the point you know before you come in you know you need to be able to maneuver the opponent on clay which is generally good advice okay so in the quarterfinals i'm playing this guy carlos fernandez uh, from from brazil he was quite good on the clay and so i'm staying back and i'm rallying with carlos and I lose the first two sets. It's three out of five. And, and uh, we had a, a captain of the team that had told me this. And, and, and I finally realized that if I keep staying back with this guy, I'm going to lose for sure. So I started to serve volley, which is what I did all the time anyway. And I, I won the next two sets and eventually choked in the fifth and lost mm -hmm. but but what that taught me was you know uh, when i stayed back with carlos on the clay it was like i chose to swim with the sharks i mean i was i was in his area trying to beat him with ground strokes and he was quite good at that i volleyed a lot better than he did but he had better uh, more consistent ground strokes than i had so uh, i realized you have to sort of somewhat play your own game you can't modify it too much otherwise you give up your strengths and you end up you know swimming with the sharks that's so good that's good and, and the same thing held for for i knew that by the way by the time i played mo when they told me i had to hit my return and in, in the back of my mind it was no 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 i'm not going to try to hit shots i don't have that's i'm going to hit the shots i have i just better hit them better against him well, uh, I, I don't know if I thought of that. I, yeah, no, I like that. I, I, I like just, it. You know, I, I think that's great advice. Look, look, guys, if you've got a question for Alan or any comments, uh, just find the chat the, the uh, chat box uh, area and uh, load them up. Um, uh, let's see, Lee Young. Lee, thanks, thanks, Alan. Always great to see here. You, Lee DeYoung, Los Angeles. Uh, you're lovely welcome. guy. Lovely guy. Yeah, Lee. yeah, no, he and, he and I have a little history from Colorado back in the day. Actually, probably back in 1966. I think Lee's got a good story about him and me playing, or him and I playing doubles. Some 66. Old you, you, you must have been about a teenager then. Huh? Well, I was. I was. Um, I was uh, a junior. I went to boarding a, 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 a boys' boarding school in Colorado Springs, uh -huh. Valley School, and. Um, and I think, I think that he and I played a, a tournament. Um, so what's next? Uh, this is just, I mean, I love this. This is, this is why I do this, because these stories from back in the day of matches um, are just so compelling. Um, let, let me but, ask you a question. Uh, yeah. Just sort of an honest one. You know, you, you, you get somebody like me and, and you tempt me to you know, reverize about old matches and so forth. To me, of course, it's interesting. I relive it for about another 10 minutes or 15, right. which is really fun. Yep. <laughs> no pressure anymore, and I can relive the fun of it. Uh, but is, is it dull to go into this detail? Should no. I not have no. gone into that? No, look, you got to understand the audience is so much like so much like I am in terms of, as we talked before about before we started recording, having been born and raised in Berkeley, California, and literally a seven minute walk from the Berkeley Tennis Club. I mean, I grew up there and I grew up in that period during the 50s and 60s, the early 70s, when we hosted the Pacific Coast. And to me, those guys were my heroes. I mean, I look at, I look, I still vividly, I'm about to turn 12 years old in the court four, the, 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 the front court in, of the clubhouse. I remember watching Whitney Reed oh. and Bill, and, and Bill Crosby uh -huh. beat great doubles play. The, the great backhand return. Uh -huh. Watching them beat the current Wimbledon champs, Ralston and Osuna, um, on court four. And I'm just thinking, this is, I don't know. I mean, I remember just the way you were describing the finals that little, the last few points. I mean, I still remember watching this. And in Osuna, after the match is over, they've, in, Dennis, I think, is only 17 or 18 years old at the time. This is in 1960. Yeah. And they won Wimbledon. And Osuna, after losing to Whitney and Bill Crosby, takes his racket, wood racket, and just very, 
just the timing was for, perfect. Just boom on the court. The racket comes out with a big, you know, crack in it, totally destroyed. Doesn't say a word, shakes Dennis's hand, shakes the other guy's hands, goes over to the trash can and drops the racket in there. And, you know, all the other little ball boys were faster than I was to get to that racket. But look, I mean, I love this stuff. And I know we've got all kinds of people here who just, who just love this. And Dennis is a great storyteller, as you probably know. Um, and we've had, and we've had Dennis on, I think six times. We've got another one coming up Friday. Um, but we all just love the stories, right? It's just fun to hear it. And, um, so who else do we got here? Uh, from Raphael Belmar. Um, is interesting Maybe to hear from the very good soon. Uh, Yeah, I mean, well, look, I mean, in your career, your NCAA playing career, you had two losses. And what? Well, I, back then, you couldn't play varsity as a freshman, right? Right. So you had, you, you had your first year uh, as a freshman. Uh, right. But you played other schools. I could have lost, but I didn't. Right. But I mean, I'm just saying over four years, you had two losses, Osuna and was it McKinley? Who was McKinley. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Trinity. You're right. And other than that, I never lost a match. That's but amazing. I, I was a very uh, intense person, as you, you could probably guess. Uh, and so every match, I, I, I didn't go out on the court uh, with anything less than 110%. I was gonna to try to beat the guy, love and love if I could. And, and so every match to me was the Wimbledon final. You know, it didn't matter. Uh, so I, did, I didn't lose unless the guy just beat me. But I tell you, it, it, Osuna was a, was a piece of work. Uh, by the way, he was in the Southwest that year in 66. Mm -hmm as was Denny and Ralston and others. Luckily, I didn't have to play them for whatever reasons. <laughs> uh, but, but when you played Osuna, Osuna was, was a magician of sorts. You know, he was so fast. Uh, he, he had quite poor ground strokes. It, Osuna won the U.S. Open in 63. Okay, so he was good. Or it wasn't the U.S. Open then, but it was Forest Hills. But uh, he, he was so fast. I remember I, he would come in like I played him uh, twice. I beat him uh, in one uh, dual match. I lost in another. And we played in one tournament. Uh, and I beat in one college term. I beat him in one and lost to him in another. But we were like two and two in college. It, but when you played Osuna, he would come in on your, on your serve with you. You know, I was serving and volleying, fast concrete courts. And, and so the, the server has a big advantage if the other guy tries to come in with him because the serving closer to the net than the, than the receiver, okay? And, and so what the receiver has to do if he's going to come in, he has to hit a low, very good return to get the volleyer to volley up, okay? Like Rosewall used to do that, great hit the ball down at your feet, come in and pick. So Osuna would do that, except sometimes like he'd make a mistake. I can remember one time he hits me a high backhand volley, which is a sure thing for me. He, my opponent's just coming up on the service line and I've got a high backhand volley and I'm in relatively close. I mean, it, it's a sure, it's a, a duck. And yet I just remember hitting one hitting it hard, and I never saw it. The ball came back so fast, I didn't know what happened. The guy, Osuna was so quick, he got to it and knocked it off. I thought, God, that's a scary thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got a high value. Right. You know, I saw him do it to Stolle at Wimbledon, Osuna. Okay, he's playing Stolle, and, and, and Stolle is a big boy with a big overhead and stuff. And so Osuna tries to come in with him, and he, 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 then he tries to lob volley over Stolle's head, you know, on the, on the first volley. He hit a good return. First of all, I tried to get it, and it was a short overhead for Stolle. And Stolle's got this big overhead. So Osuna turns around, turns his back, and he sort of crouches over so he doesn't get hit in a vulnerable spot with this overhead. 
okay? He, you know, he basically concedes the point. He's got it back to, a, to Stolle. And then his timing was so good that just as Stolle hit the overhead, he knows Stolle's going to hit it to the backhand side because that's where most people like to hit their overheads, by the way. So if you're, if you're guessing, you guess backhand. So he knows it, and his timing was so perfect. He wheeled around, you know, and Stolle didn't hit the overhead very hard because it was so back was to him. Why hit right. it hard? Right. So he hit it, right. he sort of turns around and volleys it away for a winner. Wow. As quick as a whip. Stolle dropped his, what was, you know, he, he was angry because he thought that, that Osun had been unfair, mm. you know, like he conceded the point, but then he didn't. You know, but but just to turn around and pick up the ball when you haven't been in the point, he picked it up instantaneously and volleyed it away. It, it, nobody else could do that. I mean, other people may have had as good a volley as Osuna, but nobody had his ability to like improvise. I mean, he was a maestro at the net. That's cool. Uh, Tell us. Um... I'm curious, you mentioned earlier, Stan Smith was just like a nightmare for you, a bad matchup. That name. What was the, um, why was that a bad matchup for you? The nightmare of Smith. The nightmare first, of Stan Smith. He, he was a nightmare to me. Number one, for every reason I can think of, but first, just starting out with the way he served volley. For instance, what Stan did is he'd serve and he'd run to the net very, yeah. very fast and try to close, okay? And, and he wasn't tricky or anything. He hit the ball hard into the open side. Now against Stan, you know, when I'd return, he wasn't quite fast enough. He could get in a little too far for my liking, you know? And, and, and so anything less than a really good return, he'd knock that off immediately. Secondly, I, I liked it, I, I was a very, cunning player, if I might say. I liked it if the guy tried to trick me or hit behind me or anything like that. I was very good at, you know, seeing what was going to happen. But Smith, Stan didn't fool around with things like that. He hit the ball into the obvious spot, the open side, hard and deep. So there was no trickiness. I, there was no maneuvering I could do with him. It was just a foot race. And, you know, over there, and then you had to hit the, the passing shot hard because Smith was about 6'4", and he was all over the net. Right. That was problem number one. I liked it if he didn't come in that fast. He could get a shot at the volley, at, at the passing shot. Secondly, I, I was very good at lobbing. I had a very, very good lob, tricky lob. So I'd like to go dip the ball and then lob it and stuff. If, if you lobbed against Smith, you might as well just catch it. Don't, don't lob against him. Because his overhead was ungodly good. Knock every one of them off. And the other play that I liked is when he'd hit to, uh, to my forehand, I'd run another and lob it up the line to his backhand overhead. Right. Against most people, I could scramble the next one down. Against Smith, the backhand overhead was almost as good as the other one. He could bounce it over the fence with a backhand overhead. So oh. that was quick death, too. So anything went up. The third thing that I did against a lot of people is if I was really in trouble, I would lob it way up so that my opponent basically had, had to bounce it and somewhere near the baseline. Now, bouncing overheads, if you hit a bouncing overhead to Smith, you might as well catch that one, too. Go back, you know, clock, knock that one off also. So anything I did against him on his serve didn't work. You know, nothing. Okay, knocked off the volleys and knocked off the overhead. And then on my serve, he top spin the returns hard. He hit over both sides, backhand and forehand, hit them hard. So I was constantly under pressure on my serve as well. And, and then it just sort of, sort of became bad. <laughs> I couldn't, I played him a number of times and it never went well. Well, you told me, uh, you and I talked years ago and you were telling me a story about sometime 
you were somewhere and there was a bar behind one of the sides, oh, yeah. uh, one of the ends, yeah. and the bar people were going, getting loud and all this, and you were getting upset, and Stan was like, ho-hum. I don't know. Is that, is that kind of how that story went? Uh, well, that was his, his other uh, little attribute that was unpleasant. If Stan walked around, you know, uh, <laughs> sort of, you were a little man and didn't count and nothing you could do right. was going to make any difference. You know, it was that kind of attitude. He was not cocky exactly, but sort of, uh, he looked supercilious just the way he walked, mm. you know, sort of totally upright. And, and so this was, we were playing the finals of the Southern Cals, which was actually a big tournament back in the day. Again, it was at the LA Tennis Club on that center court. Uh, and there was a bar behind it. And so th in this match, actually, I finally was into the match with him. You know, it was pretty, it was a close match. And, you know, we were somewhere around seven all in the second set. He was up a set, but I was right in there in the second one. Uh, and I tried to get to him. Uh, that's the story you remember. As, as we, I hear all this clanking and clicking, and I didn't like it. This is, I, maybe in the first set, I don't remember when I did it, probably early, uh, but, but I could hear it. It was slightly bugging me and I wanted it to bug him. I wanted it to get in his head. So as we changed sides, you know, I casually mentioned, God, Stan, here we are playing the finals of the Southern Cal and these people are making this racket drinking up there. And Stan goes, oh, I hadn't noticed. Whoa. I, oh, God. The, the man is like an anaconda, you know, playing him. You know? yeah. He has no emotion, no yeah. feeling. All he does is he wraps another coil around you, and you can wiggle all you like, and he'll just throw another coil on. He just doesn't – he had that attitude where nothing really mattered uh, that his opponent did, which I later have used myself and – Mm. written about it's a it's a great dominating his attitude was like 15 percent of the horror of playing the guy mm. was that nothing you did was going to make an impact on him that's that's, that's great well listen speaking of writing um this is your most recent book tennis winning the mental match what um showing you what four four books here prolific they're all great books um what compels you to to write this book here which is uh, which is winning the mental match because isn't this the most recent book it is and and over the years it's interesting how you can see the same uh, set of information and make one thing out of it and then as you get older and as you have more experience, you see it differently. Like by the time I wrote this book, I had already coached uh, Pepperdine for 18 years. And so I'd worked with a, a raft of players. You know, you, you're in their head all the time because that's your job as a coach. Uh, and secondly, I'd coached like Igor Knitsen, Russian pro on the pro tour for five years. And so I got a lot of just uh, back and forth input of what was working and what wasn't working and so forth. And so this book, you know, had within it everything I had learned over 50 years of coaching and playing and so forth. So I saw things differently. What I didn't see early on was that the whole issue mentally, I shouldn't say the whole issue, but 80% of the mental issue in tennis is emotions that are out of control one way or the other. I didn't realize that tennis was inherently an emotional game. It's, it's, it, it, it com it's compelling to people because it's triggering uh, inborn genetic emotions that, that get out of whack. I mean, our emotional system, I didn't realize, was not designed to play tennis matches, okay? It was designed for other for short fight, maybe. If you fight, it was made for fighting, all right? 
It was made to try to dominate and be the superior person, which is what tennis is all about in singles. It's who's going to be superior to who. And, and it's, it's an emotional issue. And now you're going to be out there for a couple of hours in this fight, and, and the emotions get out of control because they, they weren't made for this amount of focusing and, and pressure. And, and I hadn't thought about the scoring system of tennis being designed to make you choke. It's a pressure scoring system, a very difficult one. Like, even now, I prefer, well, now I'm not playing so much, but I, I prefer to play 10-point baseline games, you know, rather than a set. Okay, why? Because a 10-point baseline game is not pressure like a set is. See, in, in a 10-point baseline game, all the points count the same. You just add up the points. Okay, you may win. It gets to be tight if it's nine all in a 10 point baseline game, you know, that's pressure to kind of win it, okay? But in tennis, there are these little battles within each set that's pressure. For instance, it's designed game at a time. Each game now is a struggle and you either win the game or you don't win the game. And so you've got pressure at 40-30 or 30-40 all along to try to win games. And then it builds up, and then you got the pressure to win the set. All the work you've done now may go for nothing if you don't win the set. It could turn in an instant on you. And so uh, the scoring system is essentially diabolical. It doesn't exist in any other sport that I know of, okay? They're all, in all the other sports, it's additive. In baseball, you know, who has the most runs? If you get a run in the first inning, it counts the same as the run in the last inning, you know? And, and if you get a hit far enough, you know, time will save you. Same in basketball or football. But in tennis, nothing will save you. you. You have to win the last game and the last set or you're gonna lose. Mm. And so it's a very emotional pressure-filled game. None quite like it. You know, you have to be able to concentrate for hours. Very difficult. The, the uh, Nadals of the world or Djokovic or Federer, they're not normal people, you know. They're abnormal. Normal people, you know, we're hardwired to get angry and frustrated if, if we're losing, <laughs> you know. And they don't. <laughs> they don't do that. Well, they have to go against their own wiring. Okay. I didn't think of it that way early on. I, I knew about pressure and fighting your way through. I didn't realize that you're fighting your own emotional system in tennis, you know, and you have to keep a lid on it because it will do things that, that make you lose. Okay. Yeah. It just isn't designed for tennis matches. Tough. Tough game. So, 1972, Stan Smith is in Romania, Bucharest, playing Ooh. against those guys, and and uh, Tyriac's doing everything he can to, I guess the word is cheat him out of the match. Tyriac was one of the few guys that I ran into on the tour that cheated. Tyriac will cheat. He's a crook. Nobody was like that back in the day. Uh, you could name on one hand, Tyriac's one of them, maybe Nastasi the other, it, you know. But here's Tony Roach, you know, where I get a bad call and Tony Roach won't take the point, basically. That's, Emerson was the same way. You know, they were honest people and they didn't want to beat you by cheating you. They wanted to beat you by beating you. Tyriac was not like that. And so it's a shock to the system to play a cheater like him. Stan Smith had the perfect mentality to do it. You know, Tyriac cheated him every way he could think of. And the, and the linesman helped and the crowd helped. They're playing in Bucharest and Stan beat him anyway. 
because he had emotional control and he didn't get upset. I played Terry Eck and got so mad I couldn't play. Mm. And, but Stan, you know, and after the match, Stan said to him, which was so perfect, he said, Ian, I've lost all respect for you. Perfect. That was good. Perfect. That was good. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're going to wrap this up. Wow. It's been a, a good solid hour here, doctor. Really appreciate your time. The best place to pick up your books is over at allenfoxtennis.com. I'm assuming. Allenfoxtennis.com. Amazon. Tennis Warehouse. Tennis and Warehouse. Okay. The Think to Win book, by the way, I haven't changed my mind on virtually any of it. This was a book on strategy and strokes, which holds today about as well as it did then. So that, that's a useful book. If I'm the better player, why can't I win? That was written, that was one of the first books on tennis, the mental side of tennis. I understood it up to a point as a player, not as a coach, but as a player. And, and, and so it's an interesting uh, trip down memory lane. Uh, and it, it was interesting for its day and for, you know, the players that I knew at, at the time. It, it's not as useful, really, as winning the mental match, because I didn't know then what I knew later. It took years to really conceptualize the game. Right, right. Even more Good. deeply. All right, guys, listen, thanks for hanging out with us today. Really appreciate it. Uh, my apologies to anyone who's listened to the recording that had trouble getting on. Uh, I think I've learned something they'll do next time. It'll make it easier for you to get on. Alan, uh, I want to thank Charlie for helping, uh, your son, <laughs> Charlie, for helping us get the Zoom thing going on. And, uh, but, but most of all, I would just want to thank you for your time today. A lot of fun, some great stories. I will post the replay. Uh, and have it out there later today or sometime tomorrow. So, um, well, thank you for having me, Brent, uh, and for listening. I, you know, I might have tortured you. You had listened for long stretches, which is normally kind of dumb. No, I think everyone enjoyed it for sure. Well, so, anyway. uh, okay, guys, thanks. And as always, get out there, help someone else have a great day. Alan, again, thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Brent.